Historians of Reddit, what is the biggest FU moment in history? Hello and welcome to Robots Reading Reddit. I'll leave a bunch of cool links in the description of this video so, if you want to know more about a specific event, I'll try to link to a resource that's easy to understand. Stop sending people to kill me. We've already captured 5 of them, one of them with a bomb and another with a rifle. If you don't stop sending killers, I'll send a very fast working one to Moscow and I certainly won't have to send another. Tito to Joseph Stalin. The Battle of Alicia. Julius Caesar's attacking some Gauls in modern day France, and they go hide in a castle on top of a hill. Caesar's army isn't big enough to take them all at once, and the Gauls have reinforcement coming, so a siege is impossible. So Caesar just builds a bigger castle around the one he's attacking. He literally just built two walls back to back in a ring around the castle. The first Gaul army was already too small to defeat Caesar, and his fortifications only gave him a greater advantage. The reinforcement were also unable to defeat Caesar's army, now that he was behind several layers of spike pits and both earthen and wooden walls. Plus the Gauls inside had no way to communicate with the reinforcement outside, so they couldn't coordinate attacks. Both Gallic armies were defeated as they attacked Caesar's newly built fortifications, and Caesar emerged victorious. It's probably my favorite battle of all time. The construction and use of the War Wolf, supposedly the largest Trebuch had ever built. When it was disassembled it would fill up 30 wagons. So anyways, King Edward I built this to siege a Scottish castle. But before it was even built the Scottish people tried to surrender. To which Edward responded with a prompt no. In actuality he responded with, you do not deserve any grace, but must surrender to my will. In other words, I built this trebuch at over 40 days and I'm most definitely going to use it, and proceeded to use a trebuch at anyways. Firaxio Lamborghini was a rich man owning his company that built tractors. He talked to Ferrari about the imperfections of his car, and how to improve them, and they basically laughed at a young tractor mechanic trying to tell them about sport cars, so he decided to start making luxury sport cars, to compete with Ferrari and thus, the rivalry was born. So I'd say the middle finger of this guy to Ferrari was pretty noticeable. Alga of Kiev. When her husband died, the country that killed him assumed they'd just take over, and force her into marriage. She straight up killed the dignitaries that were sent to tell her she had to marry multiple times in the most intense way possible. She then traveled to where her husband had been killed and basically burned the place to the ground again in the most hardcore, amazing way. They made her a freaking saint. A pirate known as Jane Leffert had a bounty of $500 put on him by a governor. So he put a $5,000 bounty on the governor. In the 1970s a small town of Vulcan, West Virginia asked for state funding to replace a bridge into town. The state legislature refused to grant Vulcan the funding they needed. Instead the town appealed to the Soviet Union for aid. After hearing about the request, the state legislature immediately granted over 1 million dollars for the town to build a new bridge. If a small town in WV asking for Soviet funding in the middle of the Cold War isn't a big middle finger to the state government, then I don't know what is. Napoleon invited his brother-in-law to speak with him before his coronation as emperor to remind the brother-in-law that he objected to Napoleon marrying Josephine because Napoleon would amount to nothing. My personal favorite, the beginning of the Battle of Stamford Bridge in England, 1066. England's been invaded by a Norwegian army led by Harald Hardrada, King of Norway, and Tostig Godwinson, exiled English Earl, and estranged brother to the English King. They've already fought one battle, they've captured York. Things are looking good for them. They're chilling, enjoying their success, waiting at Stamford Bridge for the hostages they demanded. It's a hot day. They're not expecting any trouble. But wait. An English army shows up. That's practically impossible. The Battle of Fulford Gate had taken place only 5 days ago, and the Norwegians had completely routed the forces of the Northern Earls. The rest of the English army was known to be in the south, awaiting a Norman invasion. Turns out the English had ridden all the way up north in 4 days. The Norwegians were, understandably, a bit unhappy. They form into a circle. They don't have their armor with them, it's at the ships. It's too hot to be hanging around in mail. They've got helmets and shields and weaponry, and that's it. 
The English send a rider to negotiate. He tells Tostig that his brother the king is willing to offer him his earldom back and part of the rule of England if he gives up now. Tostig asks what his buddy Harold Hardrider gets for his trouble. Six feet of English ground, or as much more as he needs, being taller than other men. Tostig says they are done here. The rider rides away. Harold Hardrider asks who that dude was, because if it had been him talking, he'd have just killed the bastard there. Tostig says oh. That's my brother. That's Harold Godwinson, the king. Harold Godwinson rode up to an enemy army personally and told the king of Norway, known to be a great warrior and general, that all he'd get from this invasion was a grave. Battle commences. Norwegians lose. Tostig and Harold Hardrider both die. Huge bloody mess. English army is crippled. And then three days later the Normans land in the south. Harold is effed. He still marches his army back, gathers as much force as he can, and engages three weeks later. He's killed at Hastings. Normans conquer England. Basically a very personal FU moment that snowballed quite intensely. This requires some background. The Spartans were famously blunt. They were trained to get to the point when speaking, instead of using artsy and beautiful language that would have been common at the time, by being bitten on the thumb if they became long-winded. Now to the meat. Philip II of Macedon, Alexander the Great's father, sent the Spartans a letter saying, Would you like me to enter your land as friend or foe? The Spartans responded with one word. Neither. Philip was irate. He then sent another long-winded message. If once I enter into your territories, I will destroy you all, never to rise again. The Spartans then sent back one word. If. It was like, putting your head in a lion's mouth and I love it. Operation Paul Bunan. Here's a TLDR. If you don't want to read the Wikipedia article, it's 1976. Some Americans at the Korean demilitarized zone are cutting down a tree that obscures their vision to the North Korean side. A couple of North Koreans come out and kill a few Americans with their own axe. The Americans and South Koreans come back with such a massive show of force it's not even funny. Bombers, jet planes, 27 helicopters, a full aircraft carrier moved off the coast. Thousands of troops, troop carriers, commandos, all just to send in a squad of army engineers with chainsaws to cut down that goddamn tree. I would highly recommend giving the forces used part of the Wikipedia article a read. It's riveting and hilarious. Genghis Khan to Shah al din After the Khwarezmids plundered one of Genghis Khan's caravans, killed his people, and took his shit, he thought to take the diplomatic approach and send two envoys and an interpreter. Shah al din decided to be a dumbass about it. He shaved the heads of the envoys to shame them and sent them back with the head of the interpreter. Mr. Khan was kinda pissed, so he marched 200,000 of his boys and annihilated their town with only one quarter of that number even able to fight back. He was so pissed at the Shah that he had the rivers keeping the surrounding villages alive fully diverted so that he would literally wipe Balaraddin's birthplace off the map and make it so that it was like he never existed. No one would settle there or live there ever again. No one would be there to remember his enemy who had disrespected him. Not even the dogs or cats would be spared said Genghis Khan. French surrender in World War II. Hitler dictates that the French capitulation take place at Compiègne, a forest north of Paris. This is the same spot where 22 years earlier the Germans had signed the armistice ending World War I. Hitler intends to disgrace the French and avenge the German defeat. To further deepen the humiliation, he orders that the signing ceremony take place in the same railroad car that hosted the earlier surrender. The armistice is signed on June 22nd. Under its terms, two-thirds of France is to be occupied by the Germans. The French army is to be disbanded. In addition, France must bear the cost of the German invasion. Khosrow and Ashiroin was a Shah of Iran in the 500s CE. He took over a town, Antioch, that used to belong to the Byzantine Empire, ran by Emperor Justinian, but before he burned it to the ground, he had architects and a bunch of other people go through and record exactly what the city and its buildings looked like. He then built a new town that looked exactly the same and named it Wentioch Khosro, which translates roughly to Khosro's better version of Antioch. And that's not even all of the ways Khosro trolled Justinian. 
I recommend watching extra credit series on this dude, it's nuts. Not the biggest, but definitely one to note. In 1966, Charles de Gaulle ordered all US troops out of France, as he said the country was leaving NATO. LBJ's first words were to his Secretary of State, Dean Rusk. Ask him about the cemeteries, Dean. When Dean Rusk mentioned whether or not the 60,000 plus US soldiers buried in France were to be removed, de Gaulle simply stood up and left the room, embarrassed. Thanks for watching, I really enjoy history, so I think this might be the best thread ever. I'll leave a bunch of cool links in the description, so you all can fall down the rabbit hole of your choosing. Take care.